Tonight, uh, we're going to talk about safety at sea and some of the things that are typically not talked about because they're either uncomfortable to talk about or they're scary or uh, they're not commonly thought of. And typically, when you think of going out and having a great day on the water and, and boating, uh, you, you, you want to have fun, you want to catch fish, you want to see ni nice sights, maybe stop at a restaurant, do some things. You never ever think about what could go wrong or what could hurt people on the boat or hurt yourself or hurt your boat or anything else. And it's our job to maybe make you aware of those things, have you think of those things so that, heaven forbid that they do happen, you'll know what to do but hopefully prepare you enough to where you know what to do in advance so that they don't happen. And I'm going to start by telling you a story that maybe some people read in the paper, some people may have seen it online or, talked, or, or, or seen it a few years ago, just a handful of years ago that happened here in San Diego. And it was on this boat right here. This happens to be a 35 foot boat. It's actually a 29 foot boat is the hull, but by the time you put on the setback bracket and the the bow pulpit, it's about 35 feet length overall once you set the motors back. And it weighs about seven tons. So about 14,000, maybe loaded with fuel and gear, and guys like me, maybe 15,000 pounds by the time you're done with it. So it's not a little boat that fits in the back of your truck. It's a, it's a significant boat of significant size. And just to kind of give you a little bit of my background, I, I spent my whole life as a boater. I've spent my whole life in one way or the other in the boating and fishing and outdoor industry. And as a little kid, I can remember my dad coming home with the news that he had found a boat for us kids. And we went over to a place on the other side of town and we found a 14 foot Sears John boat, one of those army green 14 foot Sears John boats with the flat bottom and square front that they used to sell at Sears and Montgomery Wards and JC Penney's and some of those places. And we had it on a single axle trailer and we brought it home and I was so excited to have that little boat. I think I was 10 because I could envision all the places that I would go and all the things that I would do catching fish on that boat. Well, we didn't have a motor and uh, we didn't even have a paddle. And it sat on the side of our house. We had automatic sprinklers on the side that it, that, that it sat on and it would fill up every single day with about an inch of water and then leaves would fall in it and make some, kind of this brown muck inside the boat. And then the sun would come out and it would evaporate and we'd get like rings on the inside of the boat where it would fill up and evaporate and fill up and evaporate. And it sat there for years until the tires rotted and got flat and we never went anywhere in the boat until the day we sold it when I was in high school. And broke my heart because I remember as a 10 year old, I would sit in that boat and I would take a fishing rod out and my brother, I don't know where he found this, but he had a plastic carp about this big and we would hook a, a hook onto the, <laughs> this plastic carp and we'd drag it across the lawn and pretend like we were catching a fish and we'd bring it into the, bring it into the uh, boat. And so that was the, the, the extent of that adventure uh, on my very first boat. Later on, right before I got my driver's license, I found another 12-foot aluminum boat. I think it came from Sears, but it was a, it was a pointy-nosed one. Uh, had a pointed bow. I didn't have a motor for that, but my, my parents had a 1965 Galaxy 500 station wagon. And boy, that boat would fit perfectly on top of that station wagon. <laughs> and I figured, the secret to that boat would be to go down and buy one of these little handheld electric motors, drive to the lake, take the battery out of my parents' station wagon, hook it up to the trolling motor, and then I could go fishing. Well, I did that. I put that thing and roped it down on the top, and I went to the lake, and I put it in the water. I didn't even have a driver's license yet. And I put that battery in there, and I hooked it up to the trolling motor, and I got almost to the no-wake buoys, uh, off the end of the launch ramp, almost to the no wake buoys, and the battery died. And the wind blew me back to the launch ramp. <laughs> and then I had to call somebody to give me a jump to get the station wagon back home. So that was the beginning of my boating career. So uh, we've come a long way in the last hundred years or so that I've been boating. And, and, uh, and then I got in the boat business and, and had some successes and failures and all types of experiences in the boat business and 
And along the way, learned a lot of things about the things to do and the things not to do and the right way to do things uh, and the safe way to do things. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to share some of those things with you guys so that it, those kind of experiences won't happen to you. Let's go back to this non-existent picture right here. Uh, let me see if I can bring it back up here. Okay, there it is. So there's the boat. That's the morning that we were leaving on a halibut tournament that was Thanksgiving weekend about five years ago. And when you look at the gray sky, when you look at the inside of Mission Bay Harbor right here and a couple of the smaller boats that were going out here, you would never really imagine what was to take place a couple of hours later. You, you, you wouldn't have any idea what was gonna happen right here. And this is maybe a, a, a good way to draw a couple of life lessons also. And that is that when you're in the safe harbor of your home or your family or your social circle or at work, you have really no idea what's gonna happen in life as you get ready to head out of the, the channel of, of your little safe harbor. And that was the case this morning. We had six of us in this pilot house right here. And as we headed out, there were a couple of things that we didn't count on. Number one, there was, there was probably the most treacherous set of circumstances facing Mission Bay that had occurred in 20 something years. It was a maximum tide in late November. Number two, there was a very, very big swell coming from a storm that was a couple of hundred miles offshore. Big swell coming right into the mouth of Mission Bay. And there was about a 30 knot wind on top of the swell blowing with it. So we had gravitational pull emptying Mission Bay, millions and millions and millions of gallons emptying out of Mission Bay. And we had the swell coming into Mission Bay and wind on top of it. And so as we headed out into this boat, we had no thought as to the conditions that would occur headed out in a pilot house that weighed seven tons and was 35 feet long, nor did we really care. We were going out to fish. We were sponsoring and, and competing in a, in a tournament. There were six or seven boats with us that turned around, two or three bigger ones that continued to go out as we got to the mouth of the Mission Bay. Of Mission Bay. And, and frankly, none of us in the pilot house were even worried. It was a little rough, but by the time we got out around the corner and headed up towards La Jolla, it got so ridiculously rough based on what was happening at that time, it got so ridiculously rough that we couldn't even anchor or fish in the area that we planned on doing it. We, it was impossible to do anything that we planned on doing. Now I'm gonna step ahead here in a minute, in the, er, right now in the slide, just to give you an idea as to how bad the conditions were. And you're gonna see something here is the result of our day and I'm gonna tell you how we got to this position. All right, so look at this slide right here. There is the water hitting the south jetty of Mission Bay. And that's a 20 foot wave breaking about 40 feet over the rocks on the end of Mission Bay. So you can see that that's about 40 feet in the air from 20 foot faces that are coming into Mission Bay. And if you look real closely, that's the upside down hull of our boat. So that's what's left of what a couple hours earlier you saw in that calm picture headed out. A dramatic change to what we had anticipated for that morning when you see that. And in fact, here's a rescue boat, maybe 200 yards in the foreground here, and that's 200 yards back. This is after everyone had been rescued, but that's what's left in that particular situation. So assuming that you're headed out on a relatively nice morning and you're getting ready to go fishing or recreationally boating and you can take with you every kind of safety equipment that you can think of, everything that you can think of. Uh, we had an EPIRB, we had a bag in the boat that had an automatic inflating uh, raft if you pulled it. We had 
personal life jackets. We had every kind of life jacket you can think of. We had throwables. We had flares. We had two VHF radios mounted on top of the boat. We had another VHF radio uh, clipped on the belt. We had uh, smoke. We had aerial flares. We had handheld flares. We had every piece of safety equipment that you can think of. So just by show of hands, uh, and I know a couple of you already know the story, so maybe don't weigh in on that, just, to, just based on what you guys know. If you could take one or two items and make sure that you had those two items or a couple of items, when you're headed out of a safe harbor and you're going out into a great big, or what is potentially a big storm, who would want to have a VHF radio to call the Coast Guard or Vessel Assist or the, or the, uh, or the lifeguards? Just show of hands, okay? Pretty critical piece of equipment, right? Maybe even a cell phone if you're near shore. So you could have a cell phone and a radio, okay? A cell phone and a radio doesn't work very well if you're in this position, though, <laughs> if you can think about that. There's, uh, I don't care how tall your antenna is or how waterproof your radio is, if you're like this, and your cell phone certainly isn't in a waterproof case, it's not going to work very well. Uh, anybody want a throwable? It'd be nice to have a throwable for people that are, a uh, show of hands, that'd be something good to have, yeah? All right, well, you would think, wouldn't you? You'd think you'd want something that you could throw either this type or this type right here, or maybe you know a couple of these types of throwables so you can throw to people that either fall off the boat or these types of throwables and these are coast guard requirements they're important to have but again knowing the conditions that we're in these would be pretty difficult to deploy most people would like to have personal flotation devices when you think this is what most people would get. If they could have one thing, say, give me a doggone life jacket. You know, either this kind of vest or this kind of vest or the automatic type that are relatively low profile, you know, that inflate when you fall in the water. Or even now they've got the fanny pack type that inflate that you wear around here and they go poof and you can put them on. Fanny pack type. So there's lots of really low profile. But, but unfortunately, in most people's boats, most people that have their personal boats, whether it's a runabout, whether it's a ski boat or a fishing boat or a cabin cruiser or whatever it is, most people's life jacket supply looks about like this. It's a rusty, moldy old bag stuffed under a seat somewhere or in a V-berth or in a cabinet somewhere with four or five old sad life jackets zipped up in a bag. Oh yeah, Coast Guard officer, sir, here are my life jackets. That's where most people keep their life jackets. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? That's most people. That's where their life jackets are. And frankly, that's where our life jackets were. We had a couple of bags of these really cool orange ones under the cabinets and under the seats. And as we got out into the really gnarly conditions, knowing that we had to come back into the really gnarly conditions and make it back into the, in, into the bay, as we came back around and came back in, I was the guy captain in the boat and I told the other five people to get out the life jackets. I said, let's not put them on yet, but let's have them to where we can at least reach them if there's a problem. Make sense? Because we're in a pretty, pretty yucky situation, and we're having to make a long, slow turn from up towards La Jolla, and then turn around and come down swell. Remember, they're 20-foot faces, and we're having to come down swell and negotiate into between the rock jetties of Mission Bay, down swell. <coughs> into Mission Bay to get safe. I said, let's have the life jackets out, okay? Here's what we didn't know, here's what I didn't know. In fact, none of us knew. Here's what none of us knew. It was so rough when we got up by La Jolla to try and fish that I turned the boat into the swell. Remember, we're trying to catch halibut. And a couple of the other guys 
tried to drop back some heavy weighted lines and fish for a few minutes while I held the boat in gear against the swell because we couldn't drop anchor. There was no way we could drop anchor. We would either drag or sink the bow because of the up and down of the swell. So I figured, okay, I'm going to put the boat in gear. I'm going to hold it into the swell and a couple of guys can fish. At least we're up here. Let's try and fish for a minute. Okay. So picture a couple of guys back in the corner of the boat. I'm going to back this up a little bit. Picture a couple of guys back in the corner of the boat. One right here, one right here, both sides. Okay. And they're back in the corner of the boat and they're dropping down pretty heavy weights trying to fish. And I'm in gear. So I'm holding the boat into, into the swell. So the props are turning, okay? Trying to hold us into one position. And us idiots are trying to fish. And, and, and we're, we're, we're doing that. Now, even as I'm trying to hold us into position, the boat is sliding backwards a little bit. Jared and a couple of the other guys were dropping down into this corner and the, the, the props are grabbing the line and wrapping it around the prop. We knew it. I mean, it was just, you know, we'd have to cut it. You know, there's no way. All right. The problem is we've got spectra and monofilament. Spectra is a really tightly woven line. And monofilament is nylon and it, you can stretch it and it'll come back like a, like a, it'll come back like a, like a rubber band. Okay. Way out and come back like a rubber band. Okay. I'm going to show you another slide. This later on, after we found, after we found the, uh, the, after we got the boat back, this is what our props looked like. There was about 200 yards of monofilament and spectra wrapped not only around the hub of the prop, but also down onto the prop shaft and into the seal of the prop. And while we're cruising along at 10 miles an hour, we knew that we were okay. I, I didn't think we had any problems at all. And as we made the turn to come into Mission Bay, and I'm throttling up trying to come into Mission Bay, I've done this thousands of hours. I've captained every size boat you can think of from that 14 foot John boat or that 12 foot Sears boat that we're talking about to a 105 foot sport fisher as, as a, a young guy working commercial fishing boats as a kid. And I've driven everything in between and I've come in and out of Mission Bay hundreds of times in pretty bad conditions. I've driven in pretty bad conditions, but I didn't realize that we were crippled. And here's where we were crippled. We were moving along fine at 10 knots. Everybody knows how to drive down swell, or most people know how to drive down swell. You trim the boat up to where the bow is up. You time yourself to where you stay on the back of the swell. So you've got swells setting like this. They're coming in like this, just like the surf coming in on the beach. You don't want to be in front of it because it'll come over the, the transom of your boat. You want to be on the back of it. So you time yourself, you get down in the trough and drive up on the back of the solid water of the swell and stay with it, whatever speed it's moving. Does that make sense? That way you're in solid water and the, and the one behind it, and you're, look, you're looking behind you. You know, you're seeing the big wave behind you and you're seeing where you are in the front. And you stay on the front, on the back of the one. You're surfing on the top of the back of that swell coming in in that kind of conditions. That's what you learn. As a, as a kid, that's what I've done zillions of times. We've all done it a zillion times, probably. In this particular case, though, with 15 to 20 foot faces, it was very, very, very important that we stay on the back of the swell. So as I then throttled up, I'm timing it and I'm timing it and everybody's sitting there in the pilot house and I'm timing it and I'm timing it and it's time to throttle up. And it's time to throttle up and stay on back of the swell. And as I throttle up with full power from twin 250s, it's 500 horsepower. As, as I do that, the spectra and the monofilament tighten around the prop shaft. I was fine at 10 knots, but as I try and go 20 knots or 25 knots, it cinches down like a Chinese finger puzzle and cinched down cinched down enough to where it killed one of the motors. 
and the other motor's all I got, and I'm trying to stay with it, and as I'm trying to stay with it, here we are on the back of the swell like this, and it starts to leave us. And it, as it's leaving us, I can't stay with it because I don't have enough power. And the swell behind us picks us up like this and pitch pulls us end over end. So we didn't barrel roll. We kind of quartered to one side and then went motor over, over bow, boom, like that. Now imagine that, imagine that in this size boat, going motor over bow, tower on top like this, with six people inside. It kind of makes the hair stand up on my arms just even remembering it, kind of reliving it. Fortunately, well, I'm going to show you one. Uh, I'm going to show you one more slide. That's what the inside of the pilot house looked like afterwards. A lot of the glass on the bottom there. A couple of the windows broke out. But fortunately, none of the crew, none of the other five guys, had their life jackets on yet. Nobody had them on. Imagine, if you will, the boat doing a turtle and everybody's got their life jackets on even the goofy the goofy orange ones I was talking about before and now you're standing on the roof of the boat and the boat immediately fills up with water and everybody goes against the floor which is now the yeah ceiling the floor there would have been no way to get out of the boat if everyone had put on their life jackets it filled up, first of all, when it went over, two of the windows broke. The door shut for a minute, and then we got it back open. One guy put his hand between the door, snapped it in position, and the other folks that were on the boat scurried down through the door and out and under the gunnel of the boat, and we're now on that side right here, right there, holding on. Here's where it gets interesting for me. I was wearing one of these automatic inflatable life jackets. Anybody own these? Raise your hand if you own these. You own one? Okay. A lot of folks own these because they're comfortable. I need a volunteer. You want to be my volunteer? All right. Come on up here. I'm going to put this on you. Okay. All right. So an automatic inflating life jacket is much more comfortable. Put your arm through that and your arm through that is much more comfortable than a manually inflating, or I'm sorry, than, a, than an orange foamy or the vest type. It's much more comfortable. You see that? But if it's an automatic inflating life jacket, it doesn't have this cord right here. I mean, it does, but it automatically inflates when you fall in the water. It's designed to inflate when you fall in the water. That's doing its job. And so when you fall in the water, it inflates and allows you to, even if you're unconscious, to float with your head above the water. And it's comfortable to, to wear all day long. But what happened, because I had the, the, the life vest in automatic mode, it immediately inflated when the boat turtled and the boat filled up with water. So I'm driving the boat. And as everybody else swam out of the boat, this is what happened. OK? It did that. So it inflated. And I'm a bigger guy than this guy. It came up like this. And as it inflated, it grabbed me like this. OK? And flew me against the floor, which is now the ceiling. The ceiling, which is now the floor, in about this much air and it's pitch black and the water temperature is 55 degrees and pitch black and it happened like that. So now all of a sudden, we can take this off of you right here, okay? So now all of a sudden, this is worthless. All this smoke 
all these flares, the EPIRB, the raft, the spotlight, the handheld radio, the every, cell phone, everything is worthless. When it's pitch black, you're upside down, it's inflated. You can go ahead and sit down. It's inflated and, and you're against the floor, the ceiling, which is the floor, like this, and you can't get out and you're breathing in about this much air and it's black and you're, you know, completely scared to death and adrenaline's going. And fortunately, I had my Spyderco knife in my pocket. Now, a Spyderco knife, you can open with one hand. And I've always, I've always carried a knife on this side. In fact, I carry two now. <laughs> and I carry it on this side. And so I, I couldn't undo it because there's so much pressure, but I reached down like this and I could open it with one hand and I went pow, 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 and I popped the life vest. I took a breath from the pocket, looked down to where the light is, swam down towards the door, got out and around the corner. Now this is the actual life jacket that I was wearing. And I circled the three places where I popped it. You can see here and here and here after it inflated, where I popped it. Had I not had a knife in my pocket, I would have died in the cabin of that boat. There would have been no way to get out because the pressure is so strong against you and you're held like this and there's no way to get it off or get out of it, especially in those kind of conditions. It would have filled up rapidly, that last little pocket there, and I would have drowned. In fact, a couple of years after that, a couple of guys drowned at, down at the Coronado Islands. I don't remember, remember that. They were in the V-berth of their boat and they were found dead in the V-berth of their upside down boat with life jackets on because they couldn't get out. So this was the one piece of equipment that saved my life that day, this simple pocket knife. None of the other thousands of dollars worth of stuff. And those are the kind of things that you have to mentally prepare for and think about as you head off to sea in an environment that is, can be incredibly hostile. Who owns a pair of boots that they fish in? Raise your hand. You own a pair of boots? Go on a party boat? Yeah? Okay. Most people in Southern California, or most fishermen anyway, own some type of rubber boots like this. Extra Tufts or Shimano boots or Evairs or something. When these fill up with water, they're like cement blocks. You can't get them off, and you can't point your foot down to paddle, and you can't move your legs up and down. I know, I had these on when we capsized. You can't swim. You cannot swim in boots. Does anybody own like ski pants or ski bibs or waterproof pants or, or things that you clean fish in like Grundens or some of those other things like that? Waterproof nylon snowmobile suits for when it's really cold, big heavy jackets, big heavy zip up jackets with hoods. Those are like wearing garbage bags all over your, your body when they fill up with water. Imagine taking 30 or 40 gallon garbage bags and zip tying them to your body and filling them all up with water and then putting cement blocks on both your feet and then trying to swim. And then imagine trying to do it in 20 foot swells. You're gonna drown. And then do it after you've reached down with a knife and popped your life jacket. Because you have no life jacket and you can't even blow it back up because you popped holes in it to get out of the boat. So we learned a lot of things that day. We learned that heavy waterproof clothing should be taken off uh, immediately, if not before, you're going to possibly end up in a, in, a, in a storm. We also learned that we need to take these to a shoe shop and have a zipper put on the inside like this so you can zip them open and then kick them off. We also learned that the only life jacket to have on is a manually inflating life jacket to where it doesn't automatically inflate or it's not one that's auto all the time flotation. Because if you're wearing that, you can't get out of the boat. Even if you're in a center console, if you're in a center console or a recreational boat like a bow rider and it turtles and you're unfortunate enough to be underneath it. And if you're in a life jacket, you can't get out because you have to swim down to get out. So a manually inflating life jacket is the way to go. It's where you can swim out of a situation 
and then inflate it, and then you've got a life jacket. Uh, everybody made it and ended up, um, I'll show you this other slide here. This right here is a picture of just after the boat had kind of settled and the motor sunk. This right here is a, the rescue swimmer from the uh, lifeguard station. And one of the other lifeguards, we had a Coast Guard helicopter over the top of us, and we also had two or three of these rescue boats. And the rescue swimmer thought there might be somebody else down in the boat. And so they're, they're jumping in, and they're going down to, to see if there's anybody else in the boat, obviously, because we, we were all scattered. You know, uh, Stephen and Carrie and one other person actually made it on top of the hull of the boat during the first couple of minutes. And you can imagine if you're on the top of a relatively slick, wet boat, and the next 15 foot wave comes over the top, it blasts you off like flies. Like, you know, you're just, you're on there like, you just blast you right off the top and it blasts you 10 yards away from the boat. So there's no way to stay on top of that boat. Myself and one other guy, we made it around to the back and before the engines had submerged, both of the, both of the, uh, uh, skegs were out of the water with both props were up out of the water keep in mind too that the gas had spilled out and was leaking out and so we're, we're treading water in very rough water and and sucking gasoline all the way around us and we're holding on to the props which are sharp and the pointy and we're bouncing up and down we we're all cut up on on both sides but i wasn't letting go you know it didn't didn't matter and we're, we're each holding on to a skeg while Jared and one other guy made it to the rock jetty, which was a long ways away. Jared was the only guy that ended up with a life jacket. Uh, somehow one of those orange goofy life jackets uh, had floated away. And I can remember on one of the times coming up for a breath while holding on to the skeg, seeing Jared with a big grin on his face, like, oh man, <laughs> in that orange life jacket. <laughs> he probably doesn't remember that. But, but uh, he had a big grin on his face. And I'm thinking, dude, you have no idea what's going on right here, you know? <laughs> and like, oh, and he was like, wow, man, can you believe that just happened? <laughs> and, and unfortunately, uh, uh, Stephen had the worst of it. He got blown kind of mid-channel. And as the first rescue boat came to us, and you can't imagine how exciting it is to see a rescue boat and we were in the water for maybe 15 or 20 minutes before anybody got to that, uh, got to us. And uh, Stephen had the worst of it. In fact, he was on the last, and you can, you can read about it on some websites, he was on the last breath um, when the rescue swimmers got to him and put him in one of the rescue boats and we all went to the hospital. So kind of enough of that story, all right? That, that kind of sets up why we need to know what to do in almost any situation. And that's the purpose of this whole video series. Sure, we, we've got some sponsors that are gonna help us do this type of information, but it's good information and it's valuable to give back to the community to inform people about how to survive or how to even not get in a situation like this in the first place. And one of the things that you need to be mindful of, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna drop kind of my, my uh, ad lib here and just refer to a couple of notes here. Um, some of the things that I made a, a note of, things that you need to have, all right? In any boat, in any situation, these are some of the things that you need to have. And, and, I, and I did this just kind of off the top of my head, just kind of wrote down a few of these things. Uh, the little things that, that you have to be aware of that may change the course of your day. Uh, obviously, all the Coast Guard required equipment, okay? All the Coast Guard required equipment, the flares that aren't outdated that you get a ticket for, uh, the, the, uh, the throwable cushion, the life vests for everybody on board, the ones that, that, that fit. Um, I don't know if you know it, but it's a Coast Guard requirement that you have a paddle on board. <laughs> like a paddle wouldn't have done anything for us, but it's a Coast Guard requirement, have a paddle on board. Um, um, a throwable cushion, and, and then you, it's a good idea to have a, a first aid kit. It's also a good idea, if we take it an extra step, to have an extra bilge pump 
with maybe a quick disconnect in case your bilge pump fries or melts or goes bad. It's nice to have another pump on board. They're 39 bucks at West Marine or wherever you pick one up, 39 bucks to have another bilge pump that if yours burns out, you've got another one to plug in. It's also a good idea if your bilge pump goes out, and you can buy these in a variety of different sizes, to have a manual pump, one that you can put in the bottom of the boat and pump out a bunch of water, and at the very least, have a five gallon bucket. You know, if you're taking on water and you're getting a bunch of water in your boat, if you don't have a manual pump and your bilge pump's fried, if you've got a bucket or even a cooler at that point, something to bail water with, it's important to have something other than a big gulp to bail water with. You know, if you've got a Diet Coke can, it's going to take a long time to fill it up and bail water out, okay? So something to bail water with is, is very important. Extra props. How many times do you see folks come up on the launch ramp and their prop is mangled or chunks are taken out of it or it's hit on the concrete as you drag it out or maybe they hit the rocks of the jetty or they hit a, uh, the courtesy dock with their prop and they bend it. Number one, it's terrible for your lower unit because your prop shaft's going to vibrate and blow all the seals in your lower unit. But number two, if it's bent bad enough, you're not going to go anywhere with a bent prop. You can buy an extra aluminum prop for 150 bucks and have it on board in your boat. Now, if you're going to have an extra prop, you better have a prop wrench and some hardware to go with it. Because oh, the, the prop wrench is great, but you better have a prop wrench that fit and some additional hardware. Because I guarantee you, when you take the prop off to change it, you're going to drop the hardware. So you better have an extra set of hardware, all right, and, uh, and a prop wrench that floats. Okay, just, just little things like that. And as a responsible boater, as somebody who's in charge of the lives of you and somebody else on your boat, you need to think about this stuff. You need to think about what it takes to take people out on your boat. A couple other things. Extra fuses, if you blow a fuse for your radio or for your pumps or for your bait tank or your electronics or even your stereo, some extra fuses. Uh, belts and hoses for your motor. You know, a, a coolant hose, an extra belt, not that hard to change, but if you're 50 miles offshore, you better have an extra belt that goes around your, your flywheel or an extra water pump hose or something, you know, and, and those things are 30, 40 bucks, something to keep in your boat. Um, flashlight's good to have. Uh, I, I always keep a flashlight in, in a pocket, but a waterproof flashlight and extra batteries, the hand pump I talked about. How about drinking water and food? I think a staple when people go fishing or even recreational boating or tubing is beer and chips. And if you happen to be stuck 50 or 60 miles offshore, even if you have vessel assist, or even if you have uh, sea tow, or you have a kicker motor that you can come back at 10 knots or eight knots or five knots, you may be at sea for hours and hours and hours in the sun. It's good to have a lot of extra drinking water on board and uh, some energy bars or something like that. Um, how about a jump pack? You know the little things you buy at Costco? Uh, everybody's having a great time. They're running their bait pump. They're running the VHF radio. They're running the stereo. They're listening to their CDs, whatever they're doing. And all of a sudden, it comes time to fire up the boat because you've been on the anchor over at Avalon or you've been on the anchor up at La Jolla. And your battery's dead. If you've got a $59 jump pack from Costco sitting in one of those cabinets right next to your life jacket bag, uh, you'll, be able to jump your, you'll be able to jump your boat and at least get started. Um, you know, for extreme conditions where you're going to be overnight, I, I put on here one of those little Honda generators. Uh, it's kind of nice, you know, to, to charge things or, you know, an extra gas can. But that's, that's if you're running squid lights or a lot of electronics or something like that. Uh, a pair of binoculars is good, so you can see if there's any good guys out there ready to help you. A handheld VHF radio, by the way. Uh, you're not going to be able to get a lot of distance on a handheld VHF radio. You're going to need an antenna. But a passing boat, you're going to be able to hail on 9 or 16. And certainly 71 or 72 if they're a fishing boat, you're going to be able to get them. Channel uh, 18 if they're a commercial fishing boat. You're going to be able to find those guys. And with, if they're within a couple of miles of you and you're standing up, uh, you know, channel 18, 71 or 72, you're going to be able to get a fishing boat. Uh, 16, the Coast Guard. Um, and uh, it, it's a good idea to have one of these and make sure it's waterproof. Make sure it's something that'll work, you know, if you're bobbing up and down uh, in, in the water. It's a good thing to have. 
Uh, here's something a lot of folks don't think of. How many of you on your boat has an extra set of anchor gear? Raise your hand. And you got an extra, oh, well, there's, there's a couple of you that are pretty good. An extra set of anchor gear. I will tell you, in all the years since I was a little kid and I fished offshore both lakes, but La Jolla, Point Loma, the Coronado Islands, the Rock Pile, up and down the Baja Coast, I bet I have a dozen anchors and line and chain on the bottom of the ocean out there. And I bet a lot of other folks have, have a bunch of those as well. If you try and free your anchor and you're about to sink your boat or pull your transom off or pull the winch out of the, uh, <laughs> out of the bolts in the bow of your boat, you're going to have to cut it off. You're not going to get it loose. The kelp and the rocks off the Southern California coast are unforgiving when it comes to that. And an extra set of anchor and chain is critical not only because you want to anchor and fish in your favorite spot, but for what else? For safety. And you think, well, what's an anchor and chain and road? And I don't know who named it road. It, was, it had to have been a drunk sailor. It's rope, but it's, when it's on an anchor, it's road. Any other time, it's rope. But when it's on an anchor, it's R-O-D-E. An anchor, chain, and road, when, when you have an extra set of that and your engine won't start and you're about to drift onto the beach or drift into another boat or even drift into a marina or onto a launch ramp or into the rock jetty, instead of panicking, which a lot of people do, help, 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 I can't start my boat and everybody freaks out, drop your anchor, put it around a cleat, figure it out. That's why you have to have an extra set of anchor. You lose your anchor, you know, at least you've got a backup set of anchor in a canvas bag so you can stop your boat from drifting aimlessly into something if you lose power or you lose electronics. That makes sense? All right. Speaking of anchor, road, and chain, a couple of the other things that are on your boat will also cause disaster to happen when you least expect it if you're not aware. And that can be the lines that come off the end of your bumpers or fenders that are on the sides of your boat. If you've got them tied on the rear cleat and they're a little long, they can wrap around a prop. Or the dock lines that sometimes you forget. You pull out of the marina or you pull off your, your, uh, your uh, trailer and you've got your dock line on the, on the rear cleat and you pull over to the bait receiver and you load up bait and everybody's all yippy skippy happy and they take off all ready to get fishing and everybody's rigging up their rods and reels and they forget that they're dragging their dock line behind the boat. And you get four or five or six miles offshore and you see a kelp paddy and you make a big right hand turn and your dock line wraps around your lower unit and your lower unit comes off your motor. Or worse, your outboard motor comes out of the bolts into the back of the transom and tears your transom off. I've seen it happen. Little things like that, that you have as the boat operator and as the captain, as the guy responsible, you have to be aware of. Everybody else can be yippy skippy. Everybody else can be Joe Fisherman or gung-ho and having a great time, but there's got to be one guy or girl or somebody on the boat that is thinking and looking around all the time and paying attention to everything. There's got to be one sober person, literally and figuratively. There's got to be one person that's thinking of all the details that really the day is not that fun for that person. It's fun for everybody else, but it's not that fun for the guy who's always thinking and whose mind is turning and is thinking about all the details to keep everybody safe and to get everybody back safe. Does that make sense? I mean, it, it's, it, there's got to be that one person. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Kind of out. Okay. Lastly, a few of the, few of the would like to have but don't necessarily have to have. Certainly, it's nice to have assistance when you need help. It's good to buddy boat if you can, especially if you're going to fish offshore. But there are a couple of services, Vessel Assist and CETO are a couple, that I would recommend for $100, $150 bucks you join. 
because if you do need assistance, whether it's battery or gasoline or towing or anything like that, you're not going to be paying $150 an hour or whatever it is to have somebody come get you. You're going to have it as part of your policy with, with uh, assistance. So some type of auto club at sea programmed where you've got vessel assist or sea tow is important. Don't have to have it, but it's nice to have. Don't have to always buddy boat with somebody else or in a group with somebody else, but it's nice to know who else is out there. At the very least, let somebody know what your plan is. Hey, honey, hey, Joe, hey, dude, whoever it is, I'm going from here to the rock pile. I'm gonna fish from the rock pile, head up to South Island. Then I'm gonna run out to the 302, do the 181, the 182, and if everything goes as planned, I should be back by seven o'clock tonight, and I'm gonna come down swell across the nine mile bank and back into Mission Bay. That's my plan. Just like a pilot, files a flight plan. If you're responsible, and if you want to end up safe at the end of the day, you should file some type of plan with somebody. Let them know, hey, look, now things may change. We know that. But at least they know kind of that's my general area. Rock Pile, South Island, 181, 182, across the top of the Nine Mile Bank, back into Mission Bay. They know that's your general plan. Sure, you may take a left and head up at the 209, or you may end up over on the south end of San Clemente. Or you may say, hey, man, we've got some squid left over. Let's go fish La Jolla. But at least it's kind of a general idea. All right? If you're going to go skiing or tubing, say, listen, we're going to launch at Ski Beach. We're going to take a couple of tubes. We're going to go around that bowling pin out there a few times. We're going to come back to Ski Beach. We should be back by 2 or 3 o'clock this afternoon. We're going to Lake San Vicente. We're going to El Capitan. We're going to drive from here to the river. We're going to stay at X and Y Hotel. Let somebody know so that we're not finding an upside down boat with two drowned people in it two days later because nobody knows where you are. Does that make sense? Kind of, kind of know? Okay, so that's, that's kind of the nice to have, not got to have things. Some type of service assistance, buddy boating, and a flight plan, a float plan in this case. Lastly, I would make sure that uh, there is redundancy in systems. Not always co possible, and it's not always cost effective. But if you have one handheld VHF radio, it's a good idea to have two to where you and some other person, if you happen to be in an accident on your boat, knows what channel to talk to you on. Because let me tell you, when we capsized that day, when we were all in the water, nobody could see each other else after about 10 minutes. We didn't know where anybody was. And you're not gonna know where anybody else is, especially if you're offshore. The weather's snotty, you're worrying about staying alive, you're worried about where everybody else, every once in a while you'll see a head bob up and down. You know how hard it is to see a kelp paddy or another boat or a kayak in the water? Try and see a head in rough water. Which brings me to another point. If somebody falls off your boat at any time, day or night, throw things in the water first before you turn around. Somebody falls in the water I don't care if they have a life jacket on or not. Throw a cooler, throw cans, throw trash cans, throw jackets, throw everything that you can see on the deck in the water. A tackle box, everything you can see, throw it in the water. You want to create a debris field wherever that person fell in the water. Because by the time you turn around and reel in your trolling lines and hope you didn't snag them in the back with a feather, and get back to them, and the, and the swells are going up and down like this, it's hard enough to find a kelp paddy. But to try, try and find a bowling ball or a volleyball that's about the same color going up and down in the water, it's almost impossible, even if they're flailing their, their arms. I'm telling you, I've tried it. You can't find them. Throw everything you can in the water at that time. You get that stuff back later. Now, that makes sense? Lastly, super expensive, but a bag held or canister a survival raft of some kind. Not that you can always deploy it, but it's nice. It's a nice to have, not a have to have. But if you if you're going through your list of stuff, and if you want to spend two or three thousand dollars, and you're going to go offshore or you're going to go up and down the coast, if something happens, it'd be really really cool to have an inflatable that you can pull the cord and just like on a life jacket, a little two or three man raft inflates. And I've got one in a bag. <laughs> Thank goodness I've never had to. Never had to deploy it, couldn't deploy it in that situation. But 
But if you're taking on water slowly, if you know you're going down, if something's going wrong, at least you've got something else to float on rather than just hanging on to your igloo waiting for somebody to find you. All right. Any questions? It's our intention to continue with a few uh, of these video type series, not always on something dramatic and, uh, and, and as life in, in the balance topics. We're going to talk about trailer maintenance. We're going to talk about motor maintenance. We're going to talk about boat maintenance. We're going to talk about fishing both inshore and offshore. We're going to do a couple of video series on different types of gear, some product reviews and things like that. We've got some folks that are going to actually uh, uh, help us in putting on this, this program. But uh, on behalf of AIM Group and uh, Thunder Jet Boats, Yamaha and Mercury, and Jerry Vederick at Twin Anchor Boats, and, uh, and Spyderco Knives, love those Spyderco Knives, man. <laughs> Open them with one hand, save your life. And uh, uh, I, I appreciate everybody attending tonight. And uh, hopefully you got something out of tonight's series. And, and it might, might save your life someday. Re really appreciate you guys coming.